This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Marvin J. Ashton was given September 1st, 1991. Elder Marvin J. Ashton was born and raised in Salt Lake City. His father and mother taught him at an early age to work hard and the worth of a dollar. As a young boy, Elder Ashton used to raise rabbits and pigeons and worked on the family-operated two-acre produce farm, raising and selling fruits and vegetables. He later graduated with honors from the University of Utah School of Business. Elder Ashton was an outstanding missionary in Great Britain. One of the principal tracting techniques used in the early days of his mission was selling the Millennial Star subscriptions. During his first five months, Elder Ashton sold more subscriptions than did all the other elders, or at least any other elder, that sold during a whole year period of time. After he returned from Great Britain, he went to work at his father's lumber yard and continued his courtship with Norma Bernston. This particular courtship centered around tennis, for as he remembers, and I quote, she lived just down the street a few blocks. We were attracted to each other by tennis. Her family had a tennis court. <laughs> we enjoyed playing tennis together, and our affections just developed. We've been playing tennis together ever since. About a year after I returned from my mission, we were then married in the Salt Lake City Temple. And they are currently the parents of four children. Sister Ashton also reflects on those early years just prior to their marriage. Listen to what she has to say, and I quote, I was one of those girls who waited for a missionary. When Marv left to go on his mission, he said, if we feel about each other when I come home, like we do now, we'll take up where we left off. That's about the only encouragement he gave me, she said. So I dated, but I knew a good thing when I saw it, and so I stuck around. <laughs> Elder Ashton was called to an assistant to the 12 in October of 1969, and he was then ordained to the Council of the 12 and as we sustain a prophet, seer, and revelator in December of 1971. It's interesting when you talk to his colleagues as to what they say about this stalwart man. One colleague said of him, he is kind, soft-spoken, a good listener, a gentleman, a peacemaker. He is keenly interested in and unusually sensitive to the needs and problems of others. Elder Ashton is a great advocate and a great lover of young people. Elder Ashton, we welcome you and we look forward to your message. Thank you, President Seaman. Today my message will be hopefully bring new consideration and meaning to those two important words, thank you. Frankly, over the years, I've been troubled by the admonition contained in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 98, verse 1. Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not, let your hearts be comforted. Yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks. My inability to give thanks in all particular things and events or occasions have been, that have been caused by a disappointment, delay, or misunderstanding have given me concern, my failure to be able to thank God under those conditions. My capacity to express thanks and everything has been quite inadequate. Without the passing of time factor, I would have failed miserably. Appreciation for all people and events that come into our lives is most important because it is God's way of helping us to grow. Ultimate maturity is being able to feel and express promptly appreciation, being fully aware of the value and the importance of showing gratitude. How does God feel about thank you and giving thanks? In the Doctrine and Covenants we read, 
and in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his name and his, acknowledge his hand in all things. I would like you to ponder for a moment. Would you like to have God's wrath raised against you? Would you like to have God angered at you? It can come, and it will happen if we fail to show gratitude. Why does the lack of appreciation offend God and kindle his wrath? Not because he needs necessarily to see and hear our thanks, but because he knows an absence of appreciation on the part of anyone causes personal stagnation. Our growth and our progress are delayed when we fail to feel and express a sincere thank you. May we now think for a few moments about occasions and situations where we can actually say, thank thee, God, for the people and the events that have come into our lives that have made it possible for us to develop and grow and mature. Yes, for all people, for all conditions, for all circumstances that allow us to give thanks to human beings and situations for what they can do and will mean to us. How do you measure up in giving thanks in everything? Let me lead your minds into a few areas where hesitation or delay may have leave you quiet instead of expressing present time gratitude. How well do you do in giving thanks for yet unanswered prayers? Are you able to give thanks to God when there's delay or silence in matters that are of great concern to you? We would remind you as you ponder and yearn for quick responses to important needs that sometimes the right answer could be no answer. Are you able to give thanks for dress codes and conduct standards that seem to be restrictive and unnecessary for your personal aid? It takes a certain amount of courage and maturity to thank in your heart and in words those who teach modesty and good, good grieving by lofty standards and personal respect. Are you able to say thank you for an enrollment in an institution of higher education, even BYU, for administrators and instructors who expect you to better manage self-discipline and long-range priorities. Can you bring yourself to give thanks for a campus guideline that seems to be just a little much? Are you wise enough to give thanks when you are inconvenienced by regulations that appear to take away freedom of choice? Are you able to give thanks for a campus honor system that is unique and demanding? Sorry, but true. Some of us would rather murmur than measure up. You are special students and friends who can and will hopefully someday be able to give thanks for guidelines that on some occasions may seem unimportant and unnecessary, yet are self-disciplined builders. Are you able to accept the responsibility for, particularly for those responsibilities that seem beyond your grasp and comprehension? With a simple thank you, Heavenly Father, for an unplanned calling. When I think of my being called and named a member of the Council of Twelve, I have never, over the years, ever said, thank you, Heavenly Father, for this calling. Never have I done that. Many, many times I have knelt and thanked God, not for the call, but for his trust, for his strength and for his guidance, but never for the call. Perhaps someday I'll be mature enough to so declare. <laughs> In the meantime, as I grow older and hopefully wiser, the thank you will continue be, to be for ongoing support. Can you give thanks? when physical limitations are constant and trying. I'm thinking of a close friend of mine who died recently. He spent the majority of his life in a wheelchair. Shortly before passing away, we had an intimate conversation. He said, among other things, looking back now, I'm glad for the pluses. 
of wheelchair life. He had brought special experiences, people, and opportunities, and tender relationships I would have never experienced if my mobility had not been restricted. Can you, as leaders and students, give thanks when you're trying to climb an extra high mountain in your life of hills and vales? Oftentimes we pray for strength to make it to the summit in life's journeys, and the Lord seemingly adds elephant-sized burdens on our backs for us to carry up steep and trying paths. Can you give thanks in grief? Can you express appreciation to God for sustaining power when certain pain and anguish seem to be beyond your power to cope? Can you give thanks when appropriate discipline comes into your life? Many of us have a tendency to complain rather than conform to needed repentance procedures. Can you, in your life, give thanks when a decision or a ruling against us or you seemed unfair and unreasonable? Some of us give thanks in victories, but never in defeat or undeserved delays. Can you give thanks sincerely each time you give a blessing on your daily food? Recently, I had an urgent and challenging assignment. It was not family, it wasn't neighbor, it wasn't church related, but one of my most important challenges. It was a new experience. I felt ill prepared, and after an evening and part of a day of crash preparation, preceded by humble prayer, we somehow successfully completed this taxing task. When I returned to my office, I knelt down and was impressed to utter only two words, thank you. Thank, can you thank God on a continuing basis for people who share challenges, love, and lift? Let us take the time for thank you while we may be heard and others are able to hear. I have in my possession two letters among others that are very old now, they're cherished. They're thank you notes, simple but enduring. One is from Frank Riggs, Jr. of Montgomery, Alabama. This came following a multi-state conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Frank is a return missionary from Denmark. He came home early when multiple sclerosis struck his healthy body. The letter contains, Dear Elder Ashton, thank you for the thoughts and spirit you shared at our multi-state conference this past weekend in Atlanta. It was a fairly strenuous experience for me with my MS limitations, but well worth the effort of maintaining a level of involvement in service-related activity. It is very important to me. I am perniciously vulnerable, as one might guess and determined to avoid the quagmire of self-concern. And your closing remarks gave me a fresh awareness of my possibilities in this area. And concluded by saying, thank you for reading my letter. We had a response of my, I may interject today that someone had heard that I called Frank Jr. today and get clearance for what I was going to say about him, leave my love, and that's been conveyed to me again, making another choice. Thank you. I'm not quite through with the letter now and going forward with it. He said, I was no great chore. It was no great chore in writing this letter, though the job had to be done somewhat peaceful and place, place meal. Sorry about the missed strikes, but as we say, them's the breaks, and I tried to do my best. Bed and ridden with little or no use of his arms and legs, he put the correspondence together with his typewriter and a pen in his hand, in his mouth, and typed his letter to me with a motion and a movement of the head with a pen in his mouth. And 
how fine it was for me to contact his family this week and tell them thank you for bringing this fine young man to my life. The other letter I have came to me from an FBI agent in New York. He said, quote, I am here involved in a very, very important case. The days are long and the nights are longer because I'm away from my family. I've had a little bit of time to think, and I, as I have been thinking, I'm impressed to write you a letter. In the letter, he didn't say, I'm thankful you are a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles and my friend. He said, I want to thank you for what you did for me when I was a deacon teaching me to be true to myself, my family, and my church. I will never forget your interest in me. You taught me try to try hardly with all my strength to be a 100 percenter. Thank you, was the close of his letter. As we visit with missionaries, we often ask them to stand up and tell us where they're from, from and bear their testimonies and tell us about their companions and their parents. This is a great experience in learning about them and what their thought processes are and what their sense of values are. I recall one missionary standing up and saying, quote, I've been in the mission field for nine months. I've had five companions. And with his chin quivering and choked voice, he said, never once in nine months have I had a companion who told me he loved me or thanked me for what I was trying to do for him and for us. I hope and pray that someday, somehow, he continues, I'll have a companion who tells me that he loves me and openly expresses gratitude. No matter where we come from, no matter what our family conditions are, we should learn and be appreciative of those circumstances which can and lift us. I recall another missionary who said, two weeks before I was to go in to see the bishop and get my missionary forms and papers processed together to send to the church office for consideration, I had some doubts. I had some questions about the future and even about the church. I walked into the living room and interrupted my dad who was watching TV and said, Dad, I'm not so sure about this Joseph Smith business. I'm not so sure I know the church is true. I'm not so sure even now I want to go out and represent the church in the mission field. I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of misgivings. He said, when I said that to my father, he walked over and turned off the television, took the cigarette he had in, in one hand and smashed it in an ashtray and took the other hand, which held a can of beer, and put it down on the table and said, Son, I want you to know that I don't do much about the church, but I know that the church of Jesus Christ is true and here upon the earth, and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. This father continued, I want you to hear me say it because I know that, better, I know that better than most anything else in this world. This young man then said, I want my father to know that I appreciate him. He has some habits that he's not proud of. He has some habits that I'm not proud of. But he is my father and he has a testimony. I am pleased I even told him on that occasion when it was touching, he turned my hand so that I could go. Thank you for being my dad. That kind of appreciation, that kind of maturity will not only help a missionary to grow and develop, but will also be a great anchor in life's path. A sincere thank you will cause most of us to share and perform worthily in the days that follow. The most common question missionaries ask me is one something like this. Elder Ashton, what can I do to get my mother my father, my brother or sister, more active in the church. I realize now that I'm in the field of what they're missing and want them to have the same experience of, about activity in the church. What can I do to get them active in the church? 
what can I do to get them to become members of the church? In every case and every situation, I've taken the opportunity to say the best way to get your family members active in the church or to become members is to tell them thank you for all they do to support you. You and tell them how much you love them. We need to express appreciation on a continuing basis to love family members and neighbors into the church. There is no better means than love as a power tool for conversion. John Powell shares this touching experience. It was the day that my father died. In the small hospital room, I was supporting him in my arms when my father slumped back. I lowered his head gently onto the pillow. I told mother, it's all over, Mom. Dad is dead. She startled me. I'll never know why these were her first words to me after my father's death. My mother said, oh, he was so proud of you. He loved you so much. Somehow I knew that these words were saying something very important to me. Then were like a sudden shaft of light, like a startling thought I had never before absorbed. That there was a definite edge of pain as though I were going to know my father better in death than I ever have known him in life. A little later on, while the doctor came into the hospital room to verify death, I was leaning against the wall in one of the four corners of the room, crying softly. A nurse came over to comfort me and put a comforting arm around me. I couldn't talk through the tears. I wanted to tell her I'm not crying because my father is dead. I'm crying because my father never told me he loved me. Of course, I was expected to know these things. I was expected to know the great part I had played in his life and the great part I occupied of his heart. But never once did I have a thank you. The Savior has indicated in all that he has done the importance of thanks. Here are a few quotations to emphasize that point. They should be helpful as we give new thought to the importance of vocalizing appreciation. From Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks. Matthew 15 and 36, thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. Another from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 46, verse 32, Ye must give thanks unto God in the Spirit for whatever blessing you are blessed with. Another, let the peace of God rule in your hearts and be thankful. Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not. Let your heart be comforted. Yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks. And one more for emphasis, Alma 37, 37. And when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. What a great day it will be in our lives when we can show, when we can know the blessings of spontaneous gratitude and what it means to us. Appreciation of companion, appreciation of sweetheart, appreciation of husband and wife, appreciation for education and lofty standards, they are so important appreciation for fellow students. It is a most ingredient of importance to a happy marriage for the little incidental but oh so important with the words of thank you. Many a family marriage is broken because of the lack of appreciation the most mature and successful people who participate in marriages are those who understand that a sincere and frequent thank you is love in one of its most powerful displays. 
What a strength it is to have a companion who feels and expresses appreciation. Too many times I've heard people say, my marriage was terminated primarily because my husband or wife didn't appreciate anything I ever did for him. No matter what I did, there was no thanks. God loves us for so many great things that are possible, and he is asking us to endure and look upon the sufferings of his only begotten Son. We should be eternally grateful that God gave to us his Son, our Savior and our Redeemer. Without him and his love and sacrifice, we could never be glorified in his eternal presence. The greatest gift of all, and the one for which we should be most appreciative, is the gift of his Son to us for purposes and realizations we little comp comprehend today, but should better understand with each passing hour. How do we show thanks for God's great gifts? How do we show appreciation for the gifts of parents, brothers and sisters and companions, friends and associates? Tonight I'm saying by a sincere and appropriate thank you. By our lives, by our works, and by constant words of thanks and a willingness to acknowledge blessings and favors from him and others. Years ago, when the Olympics were held in Melbourne, Australia, in the spotlight on the winner's platform one day, there stood a beautiful, tall, blonde American girl. She was being presented a gold medal, symbolic of first place in worldwide competition. As she stood there, tears ran down her cheeks as she accepted this recognition. Many thought that she was touched by the victory ceremony. The thing they did not know was the story of her determination, self-discipline, and daily action. At the age of five, she had polio. When the disease left her body, she couldn't use her arms or legs. Her parents took her daily to a swimming pool where they hoped the water would help hold her up and give strength to her muscles and legs that she had now lost. When she could lift her arms out of the water, one at a time, it was an accomplishment. When she could raise one foot out of the water, another accomplishment. Another accomplishment when she could lift the whole leg. Her other goal was to swim the width of a pool once. Then the length then several thought the length of the pool and then several lengths. She kept on trying, swimming, enduring day after day after day until she won the gold medal for the butterfly stroke, one of the most difficult strokes in all of swimming at the Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. What if this champion had not been encouraged at age five to achieve Continue, overcome, and pray. What a tremendous asset were parents who assisted her in this important day and now in preparation for all of her tomorrows. Friends said that this girl always, without fail, coming and going and sitting on the sidelines waiting and watching me. Friends indicated constantly from time to time this girl gave constant thank yous to her parents. Someone had taught her well to say thank you. In recalling some of the scriptures I shared with you tonight, I would just ask for my benefit and hopefully yours to add the word now. Give thanks now, appropriately applied to emphasize their impact. If ye love me, keep my commandments now. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature now. Come, follow me now. Truly, if we love God, we will serve him now. There are those among us, though they would deny it, who are hungering for fellowship and activity in the church today. They need us and we need them. It is our duty and blessing to help them find their way now. We and they are God's children. 
we can best be fed and led together. Today is a time to let them know we care and that the Lord loves them. He stands anxious to forgive and welcome in the process of appreciation. God, give us the courage to act now. God, give us the courage to say thank you. There's an urgency for all of us today to take time for God. Wise are those who will use God's ways now in to, to ensure his eternal companionship. The time to become better acquainted my friends, with God is beginning this evening. To achieve true abundance, life must be lived a day at a time in God's companionship. As we take more time for God, we will become more like him. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, saints are sinners who just kept trying if our Savior Jesus Christ said this, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. The message is loud and clear. If we work, serve, and improve now, each hour, each day will lead us onward and upward to a significant tomorrow in his path. Today is a time for decision. Now is the time for action and gratitude. Believe me when I tell you, God is well pleased when he sees us using our time wisely. With some, he is not well pleased because they fear being anxiously engaged in his paths. Some who are willing to listen to the prophet's voice are disappointed to God when they lack the courage and desire to apply the counsel now. We make a big mistake when we allow ourselves to believe it will be easier to start back tomorrow than to thank God for a new day and a new start. May I share with you a thank you that means very much to me? Even a model. My quorum leader, my esteemed friend and respected associate, President Howard W. Hunter of the Council of Twelve, has had great difficulty over the past number of years with his mobility. First, he was confined to a bed, then to a wheelchair, then to a walker, and presently able to stand and walk alone today. He's been a great example of patience and determination and faith to all of us. Over the past few years, as Elder Boyd K. Packer and I've had the opportunity of sitting closer to him in the meetings and quorum duties. We helped him to his feet after he has been seated in our quorum meetings and other council meetings. Never, and I emphasize this word never, have we not him, heard him say thank you when we lifted or assisted him in his coming and going. Never once. He hasn't said thank you to me since Friday. I appreciate this lesson. I appreciate the strength. The use of words, thank you, are signs of strength and greatness, not weakness. I have often hoped that young men worldwide in the Boy Scout program, as well as learning to do a good turn, that, turn daily, could have as a worthy companion to it appreciate a good turn daily. May God help us to properly adhere to the counsel, thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. I pray with gratitude and share this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Marvin J. Ashton was given September 1st, 1991.